Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our Hangout with Narrative by this summer. Uh, this summer we'll be hosting a series of Google Hangouts with authors and historians across the world to explore the many aspects of African history. Um, our guests will include um, historian and author Onyaka, art historian and curator Dr. Adrian Childs, uh, and later on um, the weeks we'll have journalist and author S.I. Martin, historian and lecturer Robin Walker. Um, just to say that we are currently experiencing um, some technical difficulties, so Adrian Childs, Dr. Adrian Childs has not yet joined us on Hangout, but we do have Onyeka online. Uh, good evening, Onyeka. Yes, good evening. Um, so just to uh, perhaps maybe if you can say a few words about yourself to begin. Well, this... Um, this uh Research now has been going on for some time, and um, the purpose of the research is to enlighten um, us and to work through the history of Africans in England. And uh, this is something obviously quite and um, uh, deeply close to my own personal heart, being that uh, as a child who was born in England and lived most of one's existence here. Uh, one is profoundly aware of one's lack of recognition and um, lack of um, representation in media and within the history of uh, anything to do with the history of this country. And as one becomes acutely aware of this, uh, one b begins to feel that one is isolated and alone uh, within uh, English society, or in fact shouldn't be here at all. And it's certainly that is a view expressed by many people. Um, that the Africans um, don't uh, belong in England um, and, and shouldn't be here. Uh, but when one begins to do more research into history, one becomes aware of the uh, reality in that the African presence has been here uh, for a very long time. And this gives succor to our existence and presence here and explains that our presence in the past is part of a continuity um, which is now seen and uh, part of the present. And this continuity is um, uh, not isolated or separate, but in fact is part of a longevity of an African experience um, in these islands. And, okay, uh, and this is I mean, today we're specifically talking about the images that are present in European art, especially Renaissance art. Um, the African images, and we know there has been many. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? About which part of it? So mainly about the images that we find in European art, uh, the images of Africans okay, in well, European Okay, well, Africans have to be found um, throughout uh, European uh, history um, and are portrayed uh, in media um, and art um, and in the writings of the time. Uh, we find um, an African, African images uh, throughout the medieval period um, and throughout the uh, Tudor period and into the later Renaissance, the 18th and the 19th century. As we go into the 18th and 19th century, we see more images, and in the early periods we see less, but they're still there. Um, some of the earliest um, images are, for example, of the African in the Abravita Doomsday Book of the 13th century. Abravita Doomsday Book was constructed really as a companion to the earlier book of 1086. And this later 13th century book was to make account of the uh, peoples and the chattels present inside uh, 13th century England. And then on, I can't remember the page now, but for the Nottingham, uh, within the Nottingham uh, section, there is an image of an African looking upwards at the letter I. Um, and uh, this is a very interesting image, not because it's the first, mind you, some people say it's the first, but it's one of those images uh, which doesn't necessarily show the African in a pejorative or negative way, but looking upwards at the letter I. There are other images of Africans in medieval texts. Some of these images show Africans um, uh, rather exotics um, within 13th century. For example, images of the Queen of Sheba. Um, we see her portrayed as an African uh, woman, sometimes with blonde hair, um, uh, or sometimes it rather ornate. And also we see images of 
Africans throughout Europe, I mean, the adoration of the Magi and other texts and images, paintings, etc. And we see um, that portrayed by an African uh, called Balthazar. And this youthful African representation is to be found throughout the uh, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century, and then coming to the end in the 17th century. We also see um, Africans such as St. Maurice, we said of the Theban Legion, uh, portrayed in images in, from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th century, and we see him portrayed as an African. Uh, especially in Germany, in Nuremberg, uh, we see these images, which, even though they have fantastic subjects, uh, the images are not fantastic and show Africans as real human beings, uh, live human beings, uh, and as part of a, an expression of the humanity of the world. And in fact, the image of the um, image of African Balthazar shows him as part of one of the um, Magi eyes uh, who are paying respect uh, to uh, the infant Jesus, and therefore showing that the Africans are part and can be part of the humanity of the world, the blessed humanity of the world, and that their blackness is not in some ways endemic of some kind of notion archaic notion of curse or, or corruption or wickedness. So these images are, are powerful images, um, some of which show Africans in positive light and uh, some of which Africans in um, as uh, noble and dignified and they're to be found throughout Europe um, and they sort of decline uh, by the 17th century, by the middle part of the 17th century we see a decline in these sorts of images um, because by the middle part of the 17th century we see more Europeans uh, being involved in some way uh, with the enslavement of Africans and therefore being needing to justify that enslavement uh, and needing to justify it by creating negative images or by ensuring that those negative images are proliferated. Yeah. So we see a decrease in Africans being portrayed uh, in a positive way and in fact in some cases they disappear as one of the major they disappear. Yeah, I understand that that's um, some of the research of uh, Dr. Adrian Childs and hopefully she will come on air to talk more about some of the um, images uh, from the 17th century onwards. Um, can we maybe talk a bit more about one of the most famous images that we find in England in the Tudor period of an African? Uh, his name is uh, John Blank. So what yeah. does the image of John Blank tell us uh, about Africans and what does it say about the status of Africans during Tudor England? Yeah, this image is, um, is contained in the Westminster Tournament Roll of 1511. The Westminster Tournament Roll was constructed uh, by um, Henry the um, Eighth to commemorate the birth of his son um, by Catherine of Aragon. The son didn't live long, but the tournament was created to celebrate this birth. As you may know, uh, Henry was looking for a son to cement his uh, reign, uh, being that he was the son of Henry the Seventh, and Henry the Seventh was a usurping king who killed the um, the earlier Plantagenet Richard the Third, uh, Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. And as a usurper, Henry the Seventh um, found it difficult to uh, bring the nation together. In many ways, um, England, because it had been subject to several decades of internal conflict, which they called the Wars of the Roses and other conflicts with other nations which in some ways meant that England was a uh, rather a, um, a poor man of Europe. So the need to cement the um, power or to create the power of England during this period was, was fundamental uh, to Henry VII and later Henry VIII's Henry reign. So Henry VIII sought to, um, uh, to cement this relationship with a marriage to a foreign uh, um, uh, and, um, uh, foreign dignitary and uh, this foreign dignitary uh, was through Spain and uh, was the daughter of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile and her name was Catherine of Aragon and uh, this relationship and the child of the union from this relationship was meant to in a way support the Tudor um, dynasty um, and the hope was that the child, which would be a son, uh, would be uh, fomenting in the relationship between Spain and England, and this would buoy up England's position uh, in Europe. Um, the ch therefore, the Westminster Tournament Ball is a celebration 
not just of, as some people call it, Englishness, but of something else more, which is an attempt to uh, produce an image which can be sent around Europe to show that England uh, is, has made it, that England is ready to be included amongst the family of nations of Europe, that England is ready uh, to uh, be recognized as a power in Europe, that England is um, um, ready to be seen and respected um, as a brother uh, within Europe. And this is especially for countries like France um, and smaller independent countries um, uh, such as within what is now called Holland. There was a series of separate independent countries at that time. And, and at that time, France and England were having a number of conflicts, um, with France seeking to gain possession of previous territories, and in some cases gaining those territories, that England had once held during the Hundred Years' War. So the Westminster Tournament War was a fundamental piece of propaganda created to demonstrate that England was a strong nation. And therefore it's fundamentally important that we see um, uh, an African being portrayed in a key feature as the central piece um, of this uh, event. And as a black trumpeteer surrounded by white trumpeteers, he gives a demonstration of the um, uh, fact that uh, England too can put on events of magnificence similar to what Spain and France and to other events that were taking place in Germany. This is fundamentally important because in France, in Germany, um, in what is now um, Italy, although it was a series of independent countries, um, Africans uh, were part and parcel of those events uh, and part and parcel of those uh, uh, functions. And African trumpeteers, um, troubadours, drummers, as portrayed in numerous um, uh, pictures and images um, uh, throughout the latter part of the 15th and into the 16th century, are portrayed in those um, images. And uh, these Africans um, were considered to be add something to the spectacle of these events. Not often, or not always, as an exotic. John Blank is not an exotic and the Westminster Tournament War. Many of these other Africans are not exotics. They're not to be seen purely as strange creatures um, that are being put there um, to be laughed at and mocked. Rather, they portray something else. Uh, and in order to understand what this something else is, we need to, in a sense, know or begin to explain what was the position of Africans in Spain, since we um, uh, now believe that John Blank almost certainly came through Spain, perhaps arriving at the, on the 2nd of October 1501 uh, with Catherine of Aragon when she came to Plymouth. Um, uh, certainly he is um, featured inside um, the uh, Treasury accounts uh, within London, uh, within the London Exchequer accounts and the Treasury accounts within London from 1507, 1508, 1509 onwards and then disappears from the records from 1512. What happens to him we don't know. But we know that he appears in those records. And in those records, we know that this same John Blank, that you see here on the Westminster Tournament Wall, this same John Blank um, was married because he was awarded a purple or a violet gown and a bonnet, the bonnet being the same sort of turban that he's wearing there. And we also know uh, that uh, he uh, uh, had a mother here because in the payments to him, his mother is recognized uh, and being noted in those payments. Um, and so we know this. Uh, little, we don't know too much else about him. We know that he was paid as a trumpeteer, and it appears from the records he was paid more than his white counterparts who appear to be paid less. Uh, and we know that this um, violet gown uh, or purple gown was given to him um, um, against his marriage, in other words, for his marriage, and that this was not usual practice um, for a violet gown to be given. And also, the violet gowns, the color of it, um, and the awarding of it would be unusual since we know that records um, from the time uh, and, um, and um, um, uh, regulations um, through the um, form of um, covenants and other documents state that violet or the color purple should only be worn by those who are part of the elite household, royal household, or are themselves uh, part of that royalty, which would therefore presuppose that he is more than a, a trumpeteer, and it is part of some sort of uh, royal 
um, uh, uh, regiment within the trumpeters, or uh, that he himself is of noble birth and therefore can wear the purple gown, the violet gown. Uh, we don't know too much else about uh, this John Blank, um, except um, what we've seen, but we do know that he went in the um, Westminster Tournament, well, he appears twice. The first time his, um, his, uh, his uh, turban is brown ish in colour and plain. And, uh, but on the return, uh, once the coronation has taken place, his, um, his, um, his turban is then laced, is green, and then laced um, with gold. Uh, uh, and he's the only one of the trumpeteers that is wearing um, a, a um, turban. Again, perhaps an illustration of his Moorish um, origins, his Moorish culture, um, where the wearing of turbans was a part of the ordinary attire of, of um, uh, Moorish people, certainly of Moroscos, who were Moors who were later um, converted into Christianity and, and wore turbans uh, and, um, as part of their cultural attire. So what can we, uh, when we look at the image um, here, this image, image. We see that John Blank is in the center. Mm. Um, it seems that he plays a prominence role. What can we tell or what can we, what is suggested with the image that we see? Well, the first thing is that he's a central part of the event. He is not a peripheral image, nor is he an exotic or a strange representation. Uh, he seems to be part of the central seriousness of the event. Um, he doesn't seem to be um, uh, you know, being portrayed as something which is external to the event, and as I have suggested, that, he, that, that his presence there, his image there, is part and parcel of a European style, um, mm -hmm. where Africans are part of these events, um, and have been parts of the events from the middle part of the 15th century all the way up to the middle part of the 17th century, when they disappear from these events for the reasons that we've just been talking about. So we see these sorts of representations throughout Spain, France, um, what later became, what later becomes Italy, Germany. We see the Habsburgs taking on um, the style, mode, and fashion from Spain and incorporating Africans throughout um, the 15th and 16th century into European um, events. And we also see Africans in events in Scotland. In yeah. Scotland, uh, we see uh, an Anne Moore who was part of events um, by King James. Um, and this Anne Moore, uh, uh, with another Ellen Moore, um, were part of the events that took place, the Black Knight Days, or, or, and the Black Lady Days, where the King of Scotland dressed up as a Black Knight to escort or to, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, in some ways, um, um, have a, if you like, a spectacle mm -hmm. of blackness and chivalry, where the blackness was a symbol of his potency and his power, and that dressing up as a black knight was an illustration of that black potency and power. And in some of those events, as I've just said, a black woman, an African woman called Ellen Moore, Anne Moore, um, is portrayed with another African woman with her. We know this um, because in the poem by William Dunbar, he mockingly um, refers to this Ellen Moore. Uh, and, uh, and describes her black complexion, her hair, um, and also in a rather derogatory way, calls, says that her skin is oily like a frog, and, uh, and makes other derogatory references to her color and complexion and what have you. Uh, so we know that she was African, and that she was of that um, origin. In regards to the paintings that we find, do you think they were uh, painted, um, do you think that painter had real experience of Africans? Um, yes. With most, some of them, uh, they do not appear. Uh, some of the images that we uh, um, see, and these aren't many, a few of them, seem to be highly stylized. Right? But that's mm -hmm. not true of the vast majority of images in the 14th, 15th, 16th, and early part of the 17th century. These images often seem to be drawn with a sense of humanity, even when the, um, uh, the actual backdrop is a spectacle, even if it's, for example, the adoration of the Magi. When we see that on, like, by um, Hans Memle, uh, this is obviously an exotic image, because nobody was around to paint in oil the adoration of the Magi, right? Yes. Um, but yeah. 
But Balthazar is drawn with a sense of humanity and nobility. In fact, he is the most noble person. And in fact, he's arriving um, at uh, the event. Seems to be the chief and most important thing that's taking place. So um, uh, he's not drawn as an exotic, even though the event itself, the spectacle of it, is an, is, is an exotic fest, um, uh, event. He himself is not exotic. Uh, but he, he is, it seems to be um, not only part and parcel of it, but even the central feature. Some have even suggested that the African Magi, Balthazar, represents the newly born Protestant church. Um, and, uh, and this, and this uh, is a, uh, a key feature of Balthazar's presence there, um, in that he represents the newly born church. Um, as you may or may not be aware, or as the audience may, not, may or may not be aware, is that um, during Henry VIII's reign, they split um, from the Church, of in um, the, the church of Rome and formed uh, later on the Church of England. And as a new nation... Um, with a new religion, um, it was effectively for a time a pariah. And the need therefore to justify the new religion came in a sense from looking at the old religion and looking at the uh, symbols of the old religion and symbols of youth within the old religion. So Balthazar mm -hmm. became a metaphor for that new religion in the sense that his youthfulness or the idea of him being portrayed as a youthful Magi, almost showed the church um, going through that same process where he, um, uh, in a way, symbolized that new beginning of the church. And, and not only, as some people have suggested, represents the entire humanity, paying respect to what um, Christians believe is the, uh, um, um, uh, the Christ, but also represented the newness of the church rather than the old Magi's who represent the old images of the church, the old church, um, and he was the new church. Okay. Um, we see similar images um, uh, in English churches, um, in rod screens. Rod screens were created uh, in the churches um, uh, for functional purposes. Um, and we see in a number of 15th century images Africans and uh, Balthazar again being portrayed as a youthful young man in English churches um, in, in the southwest of England. Okay, thank you. Uh, for those of you who's just joined us, uh, we are having um, technical difficulties, so we don't have Dr. Adrian Childs at the moment. We're still hoping to have her on uh, later on in the program. Um, if you have any questions for Onyeka about um, the images that we see in Renaissance Europe um, about the status of Africans during the Tudor period or before, please do contact us uh, through Twitter. You can tweet, tweet your questions. Um, our Twitter address is at Narrative I. Um, so, Onyeko, if we go back to some of the images that we see in Renaissance Europe, how um, what is their status like? Does it reflect? Which it depends on when and where we're talking. So, if we're talking, for example, um, 15th century, 16th century, uh, especially in Britain, in England at that time, um, what what does it tell us about the status of Africans? Well, hitherto, from this, um, hitherto, the idea or concept has been that Africans uh, throughout Europe in the past uh, were slaves or were marginal or were on the margins of society and regarded in a most inferior way as exotic strange uh, the term that's often used is other there are mm -hmm. discourses in universities and people obtaining their doctorates and uh, professorships and writing copious books on this very subject of the other and the epitome of the other is portrayed as being the African um, the African is the other, other, the absolute other, the most strange person, um, certainly within medieval or Renaissance or Tudor England. And this accepted misnomer um, has been uh, continuously um, uh, pushed uh, into um, uh, uh, the rhetoric, the concepts and the ideas of anybody who writes and talks about the African presence pre 
pre-transatlantic slavery. However, if we look with an objective mind at the records, the actual original records, we see a number of things. First of all, we find that the ways in which Africans came into Europe was through diverse means. If we're talking about the Iberian Peninsula, Africans came in this 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and sometimes the 12th century, through sometimes through conquest, sometimes independently as tradesmen and merchants, um, sometimes as soldiers and stayed, sometimes as um, uh, uh, diplomats, aristocrats, and some did come in lowly positions um, from various parts of Africa into Europe. Uh, there were embassies, independent African embassies, present uh, in Spain, Portugal, parts of what we now call Italy, France and Germany, uh, embassies from Ethiopia, embassies from um, what we now call the Congo, though it was the Kingdom of Bakongo. Yes, mm -hmm. um, Africans were um, uh, African embassies were also set up from other parts, um, uh, coastal regions, um, uh, in in parts of Europe. Um, so through diverse means, these Africans coming into um, Europe um, through diverse means therefore had diverse positions and statuses depending on the nations of which they came from and the nature of how they got on in war. If they came as conquerors, then they conquered the people that were present here in Europe mm -hmm. and in some cases subjugated them and made them serve them. And that's certainly what we find in some aspects of the independent African kingdoms that were present in the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th to the 16th century. Um, the Africans uh, who it did invade in the 8th century came as far um, north as France until they were defeated yes, um, by um, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, Vandals and, and uh, the Franks um, uh, in the battles in the 8th century. Um, and despite them being defeated in the 8th century uh, in France, uh, Africans were still a representative and significant presence not only within the Iberian Peninsula, including Spain and Portugal, but also France. So there were African settlements in Picardy, um, African settlements um, in, in various parts of France and various parts of Germany and Italy. When um, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella branched out their kingdoms to other parts of Europe, and later when the Habsburgs, especially under Charles V, took over uh, rulership of Spain and Portugal. Africans, as part of the Habsburg Empire, were therefore free to travel as far east as Germany, as far north as Holland, as far south as Italy, as far west as Spain. So we see Africans represented throughout Renaissance Europe in Spain, Italy, France, Holland, Belgium, um, as part and parcel of being the significant presence within the Iberian Peninsula. Um, the fact that Africans were present throughout Europe, um, how did their status change, or did it change, once we hit from the 17th century onwards, these same Africans? Okay, what, what we have to first of all understand is that um, the, the African presence, this African presence, um, uh, and this African presence that was part of Europe, uh, the uniformed idea that we may have about status is that the status of people changes immediately everywhere at the same time. But that's not what happens in terms of status. Status says, even if we take the American situation, right, um, yeah. the status of Africans in America has been subject to change. The initial African presence in the 16th century, um, these Africans came not as slaves, in the early part of the 16th century, they came with a similar status to indentured servants like the white people who accompanied them or, or who were with them. But the status of slavery was imposed upon Africans through a piecemeal process um, over a period of time and it wasn't imposed uniformly throughout the Americas. Places like Boston imposed it and then withdrew it, imposed it and then withdrew it um, in New York, there was status of um, uh, free people and slaves living side by side. Even in the South, 
which we might think um, automatically um, regarded Africans um, as slaves. Even during the height of enslavement, there were still some Africans that were free, and even some who owned other Africans. Yes? Yeah. And this yeah. is in America where we think, or where people may think generally, they have an idea. In Europe, the situation was even more complex. Um, if we take the Iberian Peninsula, for example, we take um, what we now call Spain and Portugal. Africans came as independent rulers and were part of kingdoms. Even when later people arrived from the Arabians um, and from uh, what we now call Turkey, uh, and these kingdoms became even more diverse, Africans were still present as a significant presence as part of the aristocratic class as well as the more lowly servile class. Africans would have existed in these kingdoms and did exist in these kingdoms from the top of society to the bottom of society mm -hmm. um, in these kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula. These kingdoms, however, um, through the Reconquesta, which were when white Christian princes began to take back large parts of the Iberian Peninsula, the Africans were pushed further south if they wished to retain their independent status from the mm -hmm. newly emerging Spain and Portugal. Some Africans wanted um, to retain their status, so went south. Other Africans became incorporated in the new Spain or the new Portugal. Sometimes they lost their status, yes, but the memory of their position was retained even in their more lowly position that they now had. So we have a strange anomaly of people of an aristocratic background, of a Moorish background, but being retained in places like Valencia and Cordoba uh, and other places in Spain and in France, but of being of aristocratic backgrounds, uh, being able to speak several languages, uh, being conversant in Latin or Greek, and yet being of a lowly status. Um, so that's a strange anomaly that we get in Spain and Portugal, a very strange anomaly. And we see to a certain extent uh, this uh, anomaly repeated um, throughout um, uh, Germany and other places uh, where the Habsburgs took over um, after Ferdinand and Isabella, after 1492. And we find Africans being used as interpreters or having skills and abilities in advance of their European counterparts because of the antecedents of their ancestral cultural route. Uh, which gave them, in a sense, a step above. So the African servant, the African servant in, in uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th and 16th century, in many ways, and in certain parts of Europe, was in demand, not as someone uh, of, of, of mere labor, but somebody um, who offered a skill and ability uh, because of their cultural antecedents, uh, which was in advance of their white counterparts. Yes, and um, in, I know in your book, the back of the book has an image of uh, three Africans who are um, from Central America, and I found this very surprising because obviously they had some position in Europe yeah. to begin with, and then they left to go to the New World, yes. and then had set up their own kingdoms. Yes. Uh, can you say a bit more about that? Because yes, that's... this is um, the image that, um, I don't know if they can see it, uh, but it's the image of, um, uh, of uh, uh, Francesco de la Robe and his two sons. Yeah. Uh, and this is whilst they're in the court of Spain. They had fought a successful guerrilla warfare war against the king of Spain and established themselves as independent kingdom in what is now Ecuador um, in South America, on the, on the coast of South America, the northern tip of South America. And these um, Africans, under Francesco de la Robe and his two sons, as part of a maroon population that stretched, in fact, from Florida, the Everglades in Florida, all the way um, down south to Bahia in Brazil. Um, and these networks of independent African kingdoms, which established themselves, separating themselves from Spain and Portugal in the 15th, 16th century, became their own independent states. Yeah. And often, uh, to maintain that status, um, gave some sort of financial um, compensation uh, to the colonial empires which had once held them. And that is why um, Francesca de la Robe uh, is being portrayed uh, in Europe, um, in that he is giving some sort of financial compensation. Uh, to his previous colonial masters and 
underlining his own independent status as an independent ruler within Esmeraldas, within Ecuador. Um, again, he is not an isolated incident in that we find from north uh, to South America uh, these independent maroon kingdoms. Um, uh, we know, of course, Nani uh, in Jamaica uh, slightly later. Um, and we know, of course, of Ganga Zumba and Ganga Zumbi uh, in the um, Flavela, um, uh, um, the kingdoms, the independent kingdoms of uh, Zumbi and uh, Zumba in Bahia. Um, uh, so we know that these kingdoms existed. And we know that these kingdoms, in fact, um, started making their um, move towards um, independence through fighting guerrilla warfare successfully against Spanish and Portuguese antecedents. And this is very important for us to understand because it helps us also see how the English and the Dutch became involved in the process um, of enslaving Africans and how they gained a foothold in uh, North, Central and South America. Um, because they portrayed themselves in many ways as being separate from and distinct to um, the, um, uh, the, um, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, and portrayed themselves as separate from and distinct to the Spanish and the Portuguese. And many of these African kingdoms um, uh, uh, worked alongside Englishmen such as Diego, uh, such as Drake uh, and, um, uh, and uh, Raleigh uh, and others, believing that these Englishmen would be different from the Spanish or the Portuguese and would offer a different kind of relationship than existed uh, between uh, the emperors of Spain um, or, or, the, or the rulers of Portugal. Um, and so on this basis, the merchant adventurers were able to establish relationships. One of these Africans called Diego Negro, uh, who was a maroon and of maroon stock, worked uh, with uh, Francis Drake. Uh, and this Diego is present um, in England, uh, came with Francis Drake to Plymouth and spent mm -hmm. time with Drake, with Plymouth, and perhaps and probably um, helping Drake draw up maps um, that Drake was later going to use to circumnavigate the globe in, in the uh, latter part of the 16th century. And, and he left also with Drake when Drake began his process of circumnavigating the globe, but unfortunately he was killed en route um, before the journey um, we completed. Drake was also injured, but Drake survived. Um, Diego didn't survive um, uh, with, from natives um, with a poisoned arrow, and he was injured um, in the process and died and was apparently given a burial at sea. And this Diego Negro was one of two, or one of three in fact, um, Africans of note. Uh, another one who is unnamed, uh, but simply referred to as the um, Negro um, uh, uh, um, with a cut on his face. This same African, who almost certainly was also maroon, is to be found in France. Um, but um, having uh, escaped with Diego um, uh, and with Drake, and then at some point managing to extricate himself from Drake, and then um, uh, he was to be found not only in France, um, but under the protection of a foreign uh, European ambassador, and uh, to be said to be speaking um, out that Drake, because one of the key features of um, uh, these merchant adventurers was that they had to tell a convincing story. Mm -hmm about their journeys, a convincing story to convince um, others to invest in future escapades and to inspire other Englishmen to be involved in these sorts of activities. So part of what they had to do is present an advert or propaganda. The Africans, if they accompanied them, had to um, or um, presented a, uh, if you like, provided the added um, excitement, the added propaganda, because here was proof. He was an African who was from the region and who could mm -hmm. give testament and account to the uh, activities, the adventures, and the success of the English adventurer. That's what Diego was doing. But this other African, who was also of maroonish stock, didn't give such an account. And he was seen around the courts of Europe presenting an image of, um, of Drake as being someone who had not, in his words, done anything at all 
and that the gold, um, because Drake had said had had made a, a large statement about gold being buried, and that they had defeated Spanish men and and and, and sacked Spanish ships and and and, spat, and sacked um, uh, and uh, stole from um, uh, Spanish pirates, and that this gold was hidden and and, and dug um, uh, deep underground in places um, throughout um, South America, but this. Negro with a cut on his head um, made the statement that no such gold uh, was to be found, and that the whole thing had been fabricated. Uh, and in a letter, and other in letters written to Drake, um, Drake is um, asked to give account of how um, uh, this African is able to make such a story, and whether and whose story is correct. Okay. Is it the African or is it um, uh, Drake? So therefore, uh, people like Diego um, had a very important role in buoying up English propaganda um, uh, being stated at the time. So we see that the, this Moorish navigators or Moorish, uh, would you call them servants or helpers, employees, um, yes. were very essential to the, these Englishmen who were the first really explorers to go out to the new world. Yes, um, the Moorish, the Moorish um, um, uh, navigators were in some ways far more advanced um, than most of the present in Western Europe. The the um, the Africans who were part of the Iberian Peninsula and who were part of those Moorish kingdoms inherited not only the their own culture but inherited much of the um, science and mathematics which had come through their cultivation of Greek and Roman and Phoenician um, works. Uh, the Moorish writers, um, before those present in, uh, in Northern Europe, began to translate Greek and Roman texts. And even though Greek and Roman texts were not too advanced mm -hmm. about what was happening in North, Central and South America, they posted an idea to these Moorish navigators, that there was a land in North, Central, and South America, and that if you sailed west from the coast of Africa, if you sailed west from Spain, you would eventually hit a landmass before you hit the continent of Asia. So these Moorish navigators um, uh, and this knowledge was well known uh, to uh, Moorish navigators uh, prior uh, to um, other people in Europe being aware of it. And in fact, we have the legend of the ancestor of the, um, uh, the African uh, king, uh, Mansa Musa, Aswad, and his um, <clears throat> ancestor <clears throat> sailed west with an enormous fleet, uh, never to be found again. This story is well reported, um, accounted for, not only by tales within Songhai, uh, which is where he was coming from, but also um, from within European circles. And the legends of El Dorado, the legends of, of, of Telemanc, of the cities of gold, um, were first propagated by Moorish navigators before being taken up by Spanish, Portuguese, English, Italian, etc. Et so essentially, um, the, these Africans, this Moorish um, navigators in a sense were showing the way to the Europeans yes. of the new world. What we see is a, a conflating, a cultural conflation of ideas and concepts in mm -hmm. which the Moorish, um, the Africans, and we say I'm Moorish because more and the word Greek more is often misnomered and we might explain and talk about this briefly. Yeah. Um, in the middle part of the 17th century and the 18th century, it became necessary, in a sense, to split any achievements of the Moorish people from sub-Saharan African achievements, mm -hmm. and to, in some ways, classify Moors as being distinct from Africans from other parts of the world, and to say that these people were not Africans, and that the word Moor was simply a reference to religion, and that these people were merely Muslims uh, and were not black at all. However, in the ancient world, and certainly in Tudor England, the word more coming from the word moros and from the Greek and Latin meant black, yes? 
And this black, and this blackness, certainly in the way in which it's described by the people at the time, meant that the people had hair the same color as their skin. In other words, their, their black hair um, uh, was, was, was um, the same color as the dark, um, uh, bountiful and beautiful collection um, uh, um, of their pigment of their skin. Uh, and so these are blue-black, purple-black complexion people. Having said that, of course, within the Iberian Peninsula, uh, various sets of different peoples at various points in time came to be part of the Iberian experience and certainly became part of uh, the Moorish kingdoms. But the African um, and the dark-skinned African representation continued to be a significant and visible presence within the Iberian Peninsula up until the middle part of the 17th century, up until 300,000 Moors were expelled, um, uh, um, and up until 1568 um, and the Moorish Revolt. So until the middle part of the 16th century and even the middle part of the 17th century, these, these, represent, these people was still part of the Iberian experience. Okay. Um, and the dark-skinned African representation continued to be a significant some feedback now. presence within the Iberian Okay, experience. sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. We're just having some technical issues. Uh, we just got Adrian, uh, Dr. Adrian Childs online. Oh, Hi there. Hi, how are you? Hello. Good, good. How are you? How Fine. I, um, I'm We're so glad you can join us today. Well, thank you. I'm just um, doing a little um, homework here with my images, but so, uh, you know, I don't want to stop you from you, what you're doing. I'll just wait until you're done. Well, we're ready uh, for you now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we've. Um, we're ready for we've you now. We've, we've essentially spoke about um, how um, the image of the Africans, the Black and Moors, um, okay. is represented in European art and also the status that they had. So perhaps maybe you would like to take it further, as I understand your research is um, from the 17th and 18th century. So yeah. how are Black and Moors represented in the 17th, 18th and 19th century? Well, um, uh, thank you, and I know we only have a short time. I was going to do a little discussion of uh, my my work, um, and my work has been really centered on um, decorative arts and how um, these uh, objects uh, called blackamoors, which is uh, you know the tie-in between um, what Onyeke is writing about and what I'm talking about. These objects is this sort of a blanket uh, term called a blackamoor become symbols of luxury um, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And uh, I know he's walked writing, or you're writing about uh, researching the sort of lived experiences of yes. uh, black people and, uh, you know, and trying to uncover what we really, really don't know about it. But what's interesting is to me that it is so, um, there's so much uh, tie-in between the kind of pure objectification in some ways of these objects. Um, mm -hmm the lived experiences. Um, and so I've got something, I hope this works. We've had a hell of a lot of trouble getting things to work. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. This is our first one. We're going to do more, so keep going. I have suggestions. But um, so uh, the reason I got in, and I'm going to try to share my screen. So if, I, if you don't ever see me again, it's been nice knowing you. Because <laughs> 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 you, okay. And. Um, and so you can look at just a few things that I that I have been uh, dealing with. All right, can you see my object? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. My, my, my screen has gone blank, so don't worry. Just tell me what what you're what you're seeing, and then we will. Oh, we're looking at a um. Hmm. Uh, are we looking at it now? Um, yeah. <laughs> we're looking at a, a sugar bowl with black figures on it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and can you see it? Can you see the whole thing? I can't see it, so just describe oh. it to me. Okay, and um, and these are Meissen sugar bowls from Germany, and they have what they call blackamorphic. Mm -hmm. The reason I started 
start with them is because uh, that's what got me interested in this whole problem. Wonderful. Um, and this dates uh, from what? What, um, what does this? When does this date from? Seventeenth century. Um, no, I'm sorry. Eighteenth century. My uh, my figurines are porcelain. Okay. Um, about seventeen forties, and. Okay was just what got me interested in, in exploring this more. And then, of course, the link between sugar and blackness and the new world and, and, and slavery is all, all there. And I wrote an article about it. But then I decided to explore it a little more, look at how it goes backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I kind of embarked on this entire book project on looking at this sort of trope of the black and more. Uh, in the the luxury arts, and what is the index between luxury, fine living, wealth in Europe, and and yes. many ob objects are rare, um, like mm -hmm. I'm showing sure now. Um, so you've got another image now uh, of some blackamoors from a, a um, Kunstkammer or a, a a kind of um, uh, uh, luxury museum, luxury collection in Germany. Uh, that show how they're associated with pearls and gold, etc. Yes. So some of these are very rarefied objects, but what? how does this black figure, black amour, which is a generic term in, by this time, yes. um, become uh, the symbol of luxury? And of course it's all tied in with slavery. Uh, it it eventually becomes tied in with slavery, servitude, mm. and it's a, kind of a celebration of, of servitude in a way. Indeed, so a celebration of power. They're very complex because um, yeah. they're also beautiful and uh, etc. Um, the the interesting not... thing, the interesting thing, of course, mm -hmm. is um, and we notice how um, in some of these images the Africans are often turbaned and dressed in flamboyant attire. Yes. yes? And often their skin is a very very dark um, and beautiful purplish black mm -hmm. complexion, or yes. even just a jet black complexion. Mm -hmm. This is a parody of something else, and I wondered if you, if you knew about it. Um, this is a parody, yeah, this is a parody of something else from another time. Yeah. Because when we look in, into the 15th, 16th, and, and the latter part of the 14th century, um, we see these images not um, portraying the other, the strange, the servile, but actually portraying independent King, because this is how the independent rulers, merchants, <laughs> traders, soldiers um, in the Iberian Peninsula dressed, and that is how they carried themselves. So, mm -hmm. in the latter part of the um, 17th century um, and the latter part of the 18th century, they are parodying these African figures of power mm -hmm. and then portraying them in the more ne more servile position or as even a, as tokenistic. So, this is a very interesting thing that's happening. A yeah. thing which was once a, a symbol of African strength mm -hmm. is now being shown and portrayed um, as a sort of stereotypical image. Um, yes. And this is a very interesting development, which we also see portrayed in other things like music and fashion and culture, even up to this day, uh, where we think of um, uh, things which now are quite negative, mm -hmm. but in fact, in the past, had roots which were about something completely different and in oftentimes quite positive and yeah. that's especially with these images um, for example if we take that same African image and we go back um, uh, 200, 250 years, 300 years to the adoration of the Magi we see the same African portrayed almost identically but this time he's the, he or she is the central figure he or she is the um, most important figure not even um, the infant Jesus um, so the, the image is sort of Mm -hmm. um, they conflate, the meaning behind them conflates and this is because in a sense the African is part of the imagery of Europe, yes, yes? even in a negative sense or a positive sense, mm -hmm. he or she, he and she is part of the imagery of Europe but in the middle part of the 17th and 18th and 19th century no longer um, could the African be portrayed in the positive sense because many of these European nations were enslaving Africans. Mm -hmm, but yes. The image was still engraved on their consciousness. Yeah, the so we're seeing we're yeah. seeing the transition, the black and yes. white, which is uh, which was a positive image, a positive um, positive connotation of Africans or yes. a, a positive name for Africans in before the 15th and 16th century, but then when we get to the 17th and 18th century, that name is still carried forward, yeah. but you you have a negative connotation That's right. with it. Well, yeah, and, and so Dr. Adrian Charles, coming back to you, um, 
So what has your research so far shown you about the, these images? Yeah, and it's difficult to, uh, do you, are you still looking at my, uh, the silver, are you seeing the silver? Yeah, candle? we can see the candle uh, holders now. Yes, uh, there I heard uh, Onyeka earlier talking about Nottingham, and these are some uh, candle holders from the, the uh, middle of the 18th century Not Nottingham, and they're well known there, uh, they're, they're slave figures with um, holding up candlesticks and they belong to an admiral, um, you know, to obviously tied into uh, colonial uh, Pursuits and 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 uh, the uh, the African trade is is part of that, and so yes. this notion of the Blackamoor becomes. I agree that you you find them dressed in livery and very fine clothing and and very sumptuous and it's almost like a um a, a spectacle in some ways or spectacular. Yes. That they they evoke the spectacularness of the leaders and rulers that were once uh, known in Europe, and then they turn it around and make it them look almost almost it's almost a parody. Yes. But then there's also a whole crop of these objects that they still call Blackamoor because it's just a name for everything. Uh, yes. But they're very different, and some of them have uh, actual slaves, like these beautiful and, and troubling candlesticks that we see here yes. um, that are, are holding the light. And then I mean, I could just go on and on forever. There was a young man who made a film about these in Nottingham at the at the uh, museum. You should you should yes. see. It. Um, so, so I, I pulled a lot of things that are in uh, British uh, collections, just so you can see it. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Durham Park Moors, Thank and you. they're uh, with chains uh, uh, on them. Uh, they're the, I went Indeed. to see the photograph of mine. So it's it shows you the mm. uh, the, the actual. The so, so, it, yeah, so, in, so in a sense, these these things, these new images of yeah. the 18th and 19th century, are propaganda. Um, yes. it's, it's to show the domination and the control, and in a sense, it's to blight out mm -hmm. the history. Yes. So whenever we think of the term Blackamoor, now we think of the negative. Mm -hmm. We think of the servile. We, the think servile. Of the, yeah, we think of the position of the slave, mm -hmm. uh, and we think automatically of that. And so these images are to blot out, in a, in a sense, not only for us, but also um, mm -hmm. within Euro mainstream European culture, that the, it could not possibly have been anything other than what they are. Look, mm -hmm. they, they are objects. Yes. They are objects of objects. But what's yes? interesting, okay. one interesting uh, tidbit before we hang up is that sure. we think of them as being servile, and of course they are, particularly yes. those with chains. Yes. Um, but uh, some of the antique dealers and people that I talk to, even in museums, uh, they just haven't thought about them in those ways. They, th they still think yes. of them as objects of beauty. I yes. went to Italy last summer, and they are still making them there because um, I'm trying to find my Italian. Um, the 18th century, they became very, very, um, you know, uh, chic and and were exported Indeed. all over Europe. Um, and they they still make them in this way in Italy today because Indeed. people still use them in their yes. homes, and they yeah. think of them as a decorator's item, and and they think of them as beautiful, and they actually evoke them in the way that you're talking about yes. um, people before b before slavery really framed uh, how we see blacks in yes. uh, Europe. But um, they so so, and it's almost like that that the entire business of slavery, which is part and parcel of them from the 18th century on, they can't even they don't even look at it like that. <laughs> so, I mean, and because it's because still in their subconscious. Um, yes. somewhere in the subconscious, mm -hmm. as well as the negative, is the positive yes, representation so, of the African. And these are jostling in their subconscious, even on the representations that they see. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. thank you so much. Um, so maybe, uh, Dr. Adrian Charles, maybe if you can say last few words about what you're working on now, what you're, what you're going to be doing next, and how people can uh, get in touch with you, and maybe where they can see your work, that would be great. Um, I'm writing a book on this material uh, called Ornamental Blackness. I've, I've written an essay uh, in, a, in a book on, on the porcelain, and I've done a lot of lecturing about that. Um, there's an interesting exhibition that's being put on about a whole collection of black moors in Italy through NYU that's coming up next year, I think, and I'll have a piece in that. So there's some movement around this issue, uh, of, uh, specifically the, the, the decorative arts and and the lu the luxury arts in Europe. Um, and I have my have a website, but you know, and I also have several articles and things. But right now, I'm just more in the mode of of putting together, finishing up this uh, this book, and yeah. really trying to, to. And these ideas of, are being negotiated by contemporary African American and probably British artists as well. Um, 
in terms of um, looking back at the 18th and 19th century and trying to kind of, uh, into, look at the ideas of luxury and beauty and blackness and the kind of troubling aspects of it. So there's a lot to do like yes. this, in this realm. Uh, and I'm just hoping my book comes out before it's too... <laughs> <laughs> you know, retire. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you so much um, for coming on. Um, I'm sure we're going to do more. I apologize that we could not uh, do the hookup sooner. No, no, don't worry about it. But we'll. I'm sure we're going to come back from. Uh, we're going to do some more uh, following this. Uh, and so, thank you very much, Dr. Adrian Charles, and thank you very much, Onyaka, for uh, discussing these topics. Our next um, hangout will be um, coming soon, in um, possibly next week, with Robin Walker. So, thank you so much for watching. And if you need more information, please, please go to our website, which is www.narrative-i.org.uk. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.